And of course, we have more content. So thank you very much for that brilliant session led by Dr. Clay Moody. Uh, the fun doesn't stop here, as I say. We're about to embrace threat intelligent, uh, threat intelligence fueled investigations. And for this, we're going to bring up Chris Yule, Director of Threat Research. Chris, it is so fantastic to have you on this stage. Thank you very much for joining us. Great to be here. How are you feeling? Good, yeah, it's been so much great content, so hopefully we can live up to the standard. Yes, brilliant, <laughs> good, raring to go. I love that energy, and of course, you've got your presentation up here. So without further ado, take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so it's great to be here. Uh, we've spoken a lot about threat intelligence today. Today is all about threat intelligence. Uh, one of the questions that we often get is, it's really great to hear about the threat and understand what you know about that. But as a Tejas customer or as a customer of any platform, how am I protected from that threat? What is it that you do that turns that into something that was in, is within Tejas that then becomes investigations and alerts on our platform? When we think about threat intelligence, threat intel is really two sides of the same coin. So the, the human side that we've, we've spoken a lot about today, the understanding of the threat, uh, it allows us to talk about it, it allows us to write Intel products that you can see as the tips and TAs that are contagious. The other side of that coin is the, the systemic side of, of threat intel. So how do we turn that into structured data and things that we can apply to Tejas that becomes detections, alerts, and investigations? If we look at this pyramid, so this is commonly known as the pyramid of pain. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. This really outlines the kinds of things that we can detect in a platform like Tejas. Um, if we look at, this is designed to show you the, the difficulty for a threat actor to evade detection. So the higher up this pyramid you go, the more effective your detections are, the more longer lasting they are. So if we look at the green part, that's what we use tactic graphs for. The yellow part is where we use endpoint and network signatures. And Clay Moody, who's on right after me, uh, is going to talk about how our detection research team fuels those sides of the detections. I'm going to talk about the bottom part of the pyramid of what we call indicators, so domain names, IP addresses, and hash values. Now, typically on this kind of slide, why we're showing them in the red is because they're often seen as low-value detections. They've got a very high turnover rate, lots of noise, lots of false positives when you try and detect indicators. But what our job is is to make sure that the indicators that we're feeding into Tejas are really high value so that we're detecting the things that we need to. So indicators play a really important part in a holistic defense posture. So what makes a good indicator? Most indicators that you see are really a record of historic activity. So it's something that happened in the past that somebody saw and noted down. But what we want to use indicators in a detection capacity is really how are they effective at detecting activity that might happen in the future. And there's really three dimensions to that. The first is timeliness. So how recent is this indicator? When was the last observation of that indicator showing real badness? Fidelity, is this a true high fidelity indicator that if you see it means there's definitely something bad? Or is it low fidelity which could be shared and mixed in with other things? So it may be an indicator of badness, but it may also be something legitimate. And then the third really important part is context. So you, once you get an alert or an indicator says, I fired, uh, many people just block those indicators and say, job done. But really, what you need to figure out is what caused the communication to that domain name or IP address. And to really answer that question, you need to know what the indicator is. So what malware family is it associated with, what threat group, things like that. So all three of these things play a really important part in deciding whether an indicator is good to use for security defense rather than just a historic record of something that happened. And I'm going to talk about each of these individually. So timeliness. Uh, I spoke about how recent an indicator is and how close it is to the bad activity. Every indicator has a life cycle. So there's a time where it's created and it's first used, and there's a time where it dies and it's no longer useful for detecting badness. And as we saw in the pyramid, often the time between those two things can be really short. In our experience of looking at e-crime indicators in particular, um, many of the indicators that we see looking at commodity botnets uh, and malware infections have a shelf life of around 48 hours, sometimes even less than that. And we would say the majority of the indicators that we see across our botnet have a lifetime of less than seven days. 
So what that means is from that bad thing first happening to applying it to your security controls and detecting it, you have to make sure that you're within that window. And any indicators that you get that are older than that are likely already too old and too stale to be of value. If we look closer at that life cycle, what are the steps from that indicator first appearing to applying it to our security controls? So a bad thing has to happen. The bad thing has to be detected. Someone then looks at that and says, well, what is this? We identify an indicator associated with that bad thing. We validate this as a real indicator of compromise and not something legitimate. We share it to some indicator feed that then is applied or, or shared with third parties. You might receive that indicator through your feeds, and then at some point you'll apply that to your security solutions, hoping it detects something. So as I said, that life cycle, for that to be effective as a detection mechanism, you have to be confident that you can get from the first stage to the last stage in less than 48 hours to be effective for many of the indicators that we see. What we try and do at SecureWorks is try and be a primary source of indicators so that we are making first-hand observations of badness, triaging those indicators and pushing them into Tejas as quickly as possible. So we are uh, reducing the time between the first and last steps. We're making sure we're making our own direct observations on those indicators rather than relying on third party uh, information or indicator feeds that we then have to validate ourselves. Uh, and we're also trying to maximize the automation from top to bottom between every one of those steps because the quicker we can get those indicators triaged and into Tejas, the quicker we can detect things, but also the more likely that we are to detect things. So how do we do that? There's a number of ways, a number of platforms and processes that we have to process indicators and get them into customers' hands through Tejas. One of the main things that we do is botnet emulation. So what is botnet emulation? That's us using software to masquerade as an, as an infected host. Uh, so if you have a botnet of a million infected hosts, we will write software that interacts with the command and control servers and really sits in amongst the millions or thousands of other hosts and pretends to be one of them. And we hope that we don't get spotted as a fake infection. Now, if we can successfully persuade the malware botnet that we are a true infected host, that then allows us to monitor the things that the command and control servers are sending to the victims. So it gives us a real-time interaction with the command and control infrastructure. It gives us up-to-date situational awareness for all of our researchers. But crucially, it allows us to do automated harvesting firsthand of the indicators generated by that malware family. So any new command and control infrastructure that it sends out, uh, any new second stage payloads, if that's a malware that's delivering further malware, we're getting in real time instructions from the C2 servers that allows us to process that, triage it, and get it into Tejas. Currently, we are uh, emulating over 12 uh, malware families. Now, I could say 13, but the 13th is in development at the moment, so uh, we're very close to having 13. But at the moment, we have 12 live uh, botnet emulators in production talking to the, the live command and control infrastructure. So what does this mean? So a great story recently of the effectiveness of our botnet emulation came with the Quackbot takedown a few weeks ago. Uh, so this was a, an operation led by the FBI with a number of law enforcement partners around the world where they effectively took down Quackbot in late August 2023. Uh, Quackbot has been around for many years. I think our first observation was in 2008. It's been one of the most prevalent malware families affecting our customers in recent years uh, and often leading to ransomware engagement. So this is a malware family that we've been particularly interested in uh, for some time. Uh, we observed the takedown firsthand as it happened through our botnet emulation capability. So although it happened on a Friday night, Graham Austin, who's one of our uh, lead malware researchers, uh, happened to see one of the team's notifications we've got set up that said, here's a new malware capability that's being delivered by Quackbot. It looked really unusual. He took a look at it, and he was able to say pretty quickly, I think this is a takedown. This is very unusual activity. Uh, he worked on that over the weekend. And then by Monday, we were able to notify clients through a CTU tips in Tejas uh, that we had observed that this takedown had occurred and that Quackbot was effectively dead. That was over 24 hours before the FBI went public at a press conference saying that this had happened. When the FBI broke the news, we were immediately able to publish on our website a technical analysis uh, of how the takedown took place. Uh, nobody else was able to do that, and that led to us being picked up by a number of media outlets 
uh, to, to talk about what we'd seen and how the takedown had happened. So this is a really interesting story because although we saw this on the Friday and we, uh, we moved uh, on the Tuesday to, uh, to, to publish on that, uh, we were expecting others to pop up in that gap to say uh, we, we've also seen this happen, but nobody did. As far as we can tell, we were the only organization to spot that this takedown had taken place. And we were certainly the only ones that were able to publish an analysis of that takedown. This is the same capability that we use to monitor for indicators for new malware families and push them into Tages. So we are very confident that our botnet emulation gives us a capability that nobody else has to push indicators in near real time into Tages to protect our customers. And if you look at the, the alert on the right hand side, so that's a typical Tejas alert um, for QuackBot. Um, if you see something like this, this is not a typical indicator that's six months old. This is probably an indicator that we've observed in the last few days uh, that we've observed in your environment. So definitely one to take notice of. Another way that we generate indicators is through Atlas. Atlas is our internal malware analysis ecosystem that allows us to pump loads of malware through uh, the, the environment. And we do a number of things with that. So we run it through sandboxes to detonate the malware, attempt to classify it, and extract the indicators from that. Uh, those indicators get pushed directly into Tejas again. Uh, and what, that's a really important capability that we have. The intellectual property that we have to do that is a constant effort to maintain. We have a bunch of Yara rules that we use to classify the malware, to identify from a detonation what malware we think that might be. And then we also maintain a library of config extractors. So once we know what type of malware that is, the config extractor effectively reaches into the malware, pulls out the configuration file that contains all possible indicators that sample might use. And those are further indicators that we can push into Tages. We've, we push a number of things through, the, through Atlas, uh, all the data from our botnet emulators, any interesting files that our researchers or incident response team see. Uh, any files that Tejas detects as unusual, we can push through Atlas. And we also have a fire hose from third party malware systems uh, that will push thousands of samples a day through Atlas so that again, we're making direct observations of these malware samples uh, and we can protect customers from those. So the second uh, dimension of, of indicators is fidelity. So what do we mean by that? If we look at this Venn diagram, we have loads of indicators. I think we have millions of indicators in our systems. Very few of those are, are suitable for active detections today. Uh, we have the set of all possible indicators. We have a much smaller set of indicators that are probably still live and still relevant, but they're not appropriate for detections because they're low fidelity. And then we have a very, very small subset of indicators that we might apply to Tejas on a day-by-day -day basis. We heavily triage those indicators uh, to make sure that they're appropriate for detection. Uh, and we also age those out very quickly. So when we think those indicators are no longer valid, we will remove those from detection so that we're not creating false positives. What makes an indicator low fidelity? So things like compromised infrastructure. If you have a legitimate website that has been compromised, you might see 90% of that traffic is legitimate. It's just somebody browsing to the website. But 10% of the traffic might be uh, bad. Now, there's a balance there between uh, false positives and true positives. So there's a decision to be made as to whether we should apply it to detections and create noise, or whether we don't apply that to detections but use that for context and enrichment. Uh, it might be a legitimate thing. So some malware might do call outs to google.com, for example, to verify that it has internet connectivity. That's not a good indicator for us to use to, for detections. It might be shared hosting. So an IP address, if it's hosting 100 domain names, we may have seen bad traffic to one of those domain names, but the chances are that traffic to that IP address could be to 99 of the 100 domain names and therefore not bad. Uh, or it could just be noisy existing traffic. It's, if it's an indicator that's been around for a long time, we often see them published in blogs. We see researchers communicating with them. Uh, and it may not be a good, a good indicator to use for that. What we do is we apply all of our indicators through a triage engine so that we're triaging them against passive DNS to look for shared hosting, against all of our customer traffic so we can only promote indicators uh, that have very low noise. So we're not going to raise indicators that hundreds of customers are talking to because that's probably not a good indicator of compromise. Uh, but as I said, low fidelity indicators can still be a useful uh, tool to add context and extra data points to an investigation once you've already detected something. 
And then context is the third really important dimension to indicators. We deliver context to Tejas through the CTU threat graph. Uh, the CTU threat graph is where we connect all of the things that we know. So the things that we've spoken about today, like threat groups, malware families, indicators, domain names, hashes, files, threat intelligence publications, countermeasures, anything that can be classed as a thing that might be linked to something else, we put that in the threat graph, which contains millions of nodes of interconnected things. Currently in TIMS2, which is our threat intel management system, we have over 4 million entities that we have connected to other things. And as I say, you can see on the left, it's some of the different things that we can connect indicators to. TIMS2 then feeds our products in a number of ways. So if you go to our threat profiles on our website that some people have spoken about already, uh, all of that is fed through the threat graph. So if we make a change to the graph, that gets immediately propagated to the website so you can see the updated threat group. In Tejas today, most of the threat graph happens behind the scenes, but we're going to be working really hard over the next months and, and, and over the next 12 months to get more of that front, center, and visible in Tejas uh, for customers to use. And as well as our automated collections, we also do a lot of manual collect. So there's things, there's indicators where we cannot automatically collect them, but they're still important for us to collect. So we have a lot of human processes and people dedicated to harvesting indicators, putting them into TIMS2, into the threat graph, connecting them up to the context that we have, uh, and, and making sure that they're published to Tejas where appropriate. Uh, if you want more information on that, Rebecca Taylor has a fantastic uh, on-demand session that dives into how we ingest indicators into TIMS2 and connect them up to things, and how we then triage those for detections, which is a really good insight into some of the processes that we employ there. So to sum up, uh, and the other uh, on-demand presentation, I should say, is Graham Austin. He does a, a deep dive into the Quack bot man, uh, um, botnet emulation, which is a really fascinating insight into the FBI takedown and how that took place. SecureWorks is extremely threat-focused in its detections. Uh, while indicators aren't always the most effective way of detection, they still provide real value if they're timely and high fidelity, and they should be part of a holistic defense. Uh, we invest significant resources in being a primary source of threat indicators to Tejas, rather than simply passing on feeds of indicators from third parties, which is generally a fairly low value way uh, of detecting badness. That's all I have, so back to Sarah. Thank you so much, Chris. Really, really interesting. And I was wondering, why do you think it is that SecureWorks was the only one to spot that Quackbot takedown? I'm really curious to know. It's an interesting question. It's one that surprised us, and I think it's really... It, it takes a lot of things to work in concert for that to happen. So we've got three things, really. We've got the technical capability to, to monitor the, 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 the botnets. We have the, the threat, the, the, the technical systems and processes that then take that information, notify people in teams and things like that that allow people to work with that data. But then we also have the human expertise to immediately look at something that the process is telling them and say, that doesn't look right. I need to go and dive deeper into that. So. Uh, Many people might have one or two of those things, but we, we try and make sure that we have all three of those things working closely together, which I think makes us really effective. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you so much once all again. Right. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much to Chris. We've got even more lined up for you, but let's take another quick breather and we'll be back in five. <laughs> 